Excellent. And we're live on Facebook and YouTube. So <laughs> George, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I'm super, super stoked to be here. <laughs> I've, I've been enjoying our, our pre-conversation here. Hopefully there's not an echo out there. Um, George will be clear. <laughs> I know. I know. I sound clear on my end, so we'll figure it out pretty quick. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, we know some same. We know some of the same people, and you come highly recommended. Um, and when I saw the word lighthouse on on your Facebook page, I wanted to know more about that because my experience with lighthouse marketing, and I'm not sure if it's the same for you, but or the lighthouse approach to marketing is that you're there to guide people in rather than being like a tugboat where you go out and chase people and move them, you know, <laughs> try to, try to steer them in. And, and, that, and am I tracking with you? Is that what you mean by lighthouse? You're yeah. tracking. I, I tell people, I tell people that proactive businesses build legacy businesses and reactive businesses go out of business. And, our job isn't to throw hooks out and pull boats in. It's just to keep our light steady until they decide to dock at shore. And then we help them once they're there. Mm. And how did you discover that? It sounds like you made plenty of mistakes <laughs> did <it> differently <laughs> in the past. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I've been in the digital marketing space since 2009. So I was an active duty Marine for 12 years. And then I had like this two year transition where they told me they were going to medically separate me due to too many injuries. And I was trying to figure out what to do, but I had been documenting my food journey. And so I became a food blogger. And so everything I've done is self-taught. I've, I've made more mistakes than anyone should have to make, but I'm stubborn. So I tend to repeat them until it hurts bad enough to learn the lesson. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it actually came about by accident. So I trademarked uh, a term relationship speed algorithms about four years ago when I started using like human marketing to scale businesses. And, you know, I've built over 300, seven, eight, nine, and 10 figure businesses. I've taken two companies to unicorn status, a billion dollars each. And under three years by using the, the principles that I teach, I don't, strategies and tactics don't work. Principles work. And then you stack strategies and tactics on top of it because there's a foundation and it's there. And one of the things that I talked about a lot was customer journeys. And, you know, pre-current state of the world, an average customer required between 26 and 55 touch points to go from self-identifying I want something to spending $60, 25 to 60. Wow. This was a couple of weeks ago. Now it's more <laughs> like 100 to 150 because you know, at that time, the state of the world was neutral and you were trying to move people from neutrality to pleasure. And now the state of the world is trying to move people from pain to neutrality and then neutrality to pleasure. Right. And so, you know, in, in designing all of this, I was talking for years, I teach these concepts like called the conscious and subconscious customer journey and what it was and, and all these different pieces. And I was like talking about touch points and how customer journeys aren't linear, but they're a series of touch points or nodes and you have to have an ecosystem that all leads to one place. And my graphic designer is my brother. And I was coming up with uh, terms like actual terms for my mastermind, like what our tagline was and relationships with algorithms was one. And then another one was clearing the path to your unapologetically authentic self. And then when I started using like clearing the path, then one of my students was like, you know, like a lighthouse. And I was like, maybe. And then we kind of just took it and ran with it. Like I have an eight foot lighthouse in my home office um, <laughs> that literally spins behind me as I do it. And it was such a powerful business analogy. And there were so many parts to it from enrollment to consistency, to building a foundation that lasts forever. Like when you go look at landmarks or like lighthouses, they're historic landmarks because they were built to withstand, you know, uncertainty and crazy times and recessions and weathers and hurricanes, just like businesses should be mm -hmm. in the long game. And so there were so many levels of meaning into it that I just had to kind of jump onto it. And then I basically went through everything I'd done as a, you know, uh, one of the most sought after digital marketing consultants in the world. And I went back and looked at like 300 clients, all their notes, what I did, all my processes, all my systems. And I started renaming everything nautically. And so I've been studying lighthouses pretty effectively for like two years now. And I can tell you, you know, what a Fresno lens is and their light signatures and how they spin. But, you know, when it, it comes to marketing and business, I tell people, you know, one of the mistakes I see most companies make is, you know, there'll be a storm out there and a ton of potential customers and they'll all be within like a hundred to 500 yards offshore. And one of the boats starts sinking 
and the light keeper jumps in the water to save them, but doesn't realize that the other boats die. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's such a powerful analogy for marketing. And, you know, when we think about like direct response marketing for years, it's been telling people what's wrong with them, right? Like creating reactants and dissonance and it's right. never really worked, but it, it's gotten away with it because there hasn't really been a good filter. Mm -hmm. And really the name of the game is getting people to enroll into their vision and choosing to come to shore versus like capturing them like you're a pirate and pulling them in. And so I, I just think a lighthouse captures that so beautifully well. Like I'm actually sleeving my whole leg with my branding. My entire lighthouse is getting tattooed on my leg. Um, <laughs> and, and the other side of it, uh, Rod, the, the big part was, is that it really started to come from like three years ago. Um, I knew that what was missing in my own life, like my personal life was a personal mission statement. Like it's easy to get up and check boxes. Even as an entrepreneur, we never have a lack of things to do, right? Like my to-do list is 8,000 things long every single day, especially owning eight companies. <laughs> and, um, but I felt like I was just kind of always just like checking boxes and running numbers and doing all that stuff. And I went to the jungle for two weeks and spent basically like a week and a half in silence, just away from the world and disconnected and just very, in silence and, and did a lot of healing and realized that like, I was basically lacking a vision for my own life. And, you know, I was already successful, New York times bestseller, you know, number one app in the world, blah, 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 blah. That didn't mean crap. Cause I was just unhappy. And I looked at it and I said, you know, I need to figure out how to use my life, the things that I've experienced from sexual abuse and trauma and, you know, war and death and suicides and, you know, addictions and things like that and, and do something with it. And so I wrote a personal mission statement for my life that said, uh, my mission is to stand with structure in the face of resistance to create possibility. And it just so happens that that's probably the best definition of a lighthouse that exists as well. And mm -hmm. so it all kind of intertwined to where like I am my business, I am what I do. And I also stand for personally, like everything that we teach in business. And so those were kind of the two ways in which I was moving towards it and ended up, you know, with a lighthouse at the end. Hmm. I love it. One thing, there's several things I could ask you about there, but um, one phrase you said was clearing a path to your, what was it? To, to your unapologetically authentic self. Nice. So is that part of your coaching? Like you help people do that? Because you mentioned, you know, you are your business, you know, and I feel like that. And I think the times where I feel like I'm really lost and sort of banging my head against the wall is uh, when I'm doing things that aren't authentic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, for, for me, like, you know, one of the things like I famously say is I tell people, I said, nobody has a marketing problem. Everybody has a relationship problem. Mm. And it starts with yourself, then your team and your customers informed in that order. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in the world of marketing and business, you can always fake your way to seven figures. Like you can fake your way to a million dollars. You can transact enough and spam enough and do whatever, but yeah. either one of two things happens. Number one is it ends up killing you because of the incongruency and the act being put on, or it mm -hmm. ends up killing your business because everybody knows in the first place that it's completely incongruent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we think about it, you know, marketing starts from the top, like the mission, vision, the values, the way in which the owner, the entrepreneur, the CEO, the CMO, the CEO operate, the way that they live their life, the way that they lead by example is what informs the team to mimic that behavior. And it's not words. Words don't mean crap, right? Like only 7% of communication is verbal. The other 93% is through body language and emotions. And so when it's toxic from the top down, like there's dissonance or incongruency, then it gives back doors to the team mm. and it either sets them up to fail and take blame or it sets them up to fail by enrolling them in something that isn't ethically sound and not going to work in the first place. Mm. And so then that those people, the ones writing emails, writing social copy, responding to comments, and they're taking that example, and that energy, and that's how they're marketing the company. And mm. so everyone's like, oh, our ads didn't convert. I'm like, it has nothing to do with your ad. <laughs> I was like, like, look at the trail of events that leads back to it. And so you know, it's really, really kind of a part of it. Like you can't build a successful business if it's something you hate. Like, you know, we, we leave the nine to five to be able to do this and serve people, but, but nowhere in the world of marketing or business, like is Nike slogan say, just do it only if you pay me. Right. <laughs> or, you know what I mean? And it, yeah. it's like so many businesses that are incongruent are built on transactions, but mm -hmm. that's not a business. 
Like that's really just like high end prostitution or low end prostitution, depending on how you define it. And really like it has to come from the top down that like the reason that businesses exist are to make a difference. It's to move our customers or potential customers one step closer to their goal and give them the ability to do that agnostic of a credit card purchase. It just so happens that when you do that, they do whip out their credit card and they tend to spend five to 10 times more money when you actually help them. But, you know, when we think about it, you can't help a customer because you can't empathize. You can't get into their shoes. You can't be compassionate. You can't understand where they are in your world if you're sitting at the top completely disconnected, convincing yourself that it's one way or just kind of checking boxes. And so, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, no matter what company I go into, whether it's a Fortune 50 company to consult and I come in with sometimes a pink mohawk tattoos and a hoodie and they're like, who are you and why did we pay you this much money? And I'm like, just sit down and listen. <laughs> And in the first 30 minutes, I remove the C-suite from the room and the team tells me what it is. And I keep the C-suite out for three days and somehow the company doubles. Mm. And I'm like, oh, yeah, see, nobody has that marketing problem, right? I'm like, they're afraid to speak their mind. They're not allowed to step in their power. And so, you know, it's, it's really just helping everybody understand that at the end of the day, we're all people. And on the other end of everything that we do in marketing is another human being. And the easiest way to get a conversion or to get a... a a customer is to understand who they are and then help them get one step further. But that only happens when you can truly understand who you are and relate to them. And in a level like this, like a, mm-hmm. I define marketing as a two way value based long term relationship, not a one way dictatorship like most people think it is. And so mm-hmm. it, it's just, yeah, clearing the path to your unapologetically authentic self, not being afraid to be, you know, share content when it's not perfect, not being afraid to share like the scary objections, not being afraid to talk about the things that need to be talked about to lead, right? Like Mm -hmm. you're an entrepreneur, you're a business owner, you've basically made a stand in this world that you're going to lead. And that doesn't happen by sitting passively and letting somebody else do it. And it also doesn't mean that every conversation is going to be easy. And so it all starts with congruency at the core. And so, you know, a a tangible example too, is one of my companies, uh, Crazy Muscle, we sell supplements and we um, decided that we didn't want to be like every other supplement company and creatine, for example, they're all powder. You have to take so much. We spent a year developing a pill form and three pills get you hundred percent uptake of three monohydrates of creatine, which is one of the most effective ones on the market. Uh, but the problem is the pills are like the size of my pinky because you have to have so much. And so most companies are like, don't tell them, just get it. Like we put it on the page. It's like, these things are hard. You're going to want to cut them in half. (laughs) And if you get them and you can't take them, tell us, we'll give you a refund and you can keep it. Right. So like we go straight for the jugular objection, but we can only do that because we're being honest and congruent. Like we're being authentic. Like we know, like I struggle to take them and I don't mind taking supplements, but it's like everybody wanted it and we're like, well, we can do it, but it's going to be this. And so we go straight out there. We don't try to hide it. We don't try to, you know, put it behind the scenes. And and as a result, you know, we have a, you know, 10 figure company, not 10 figure company, a, a eight figure company. And, um, and it, it only starts with that congruency piece. So that, that's kind of a, a little bit of a rant on, on how I see it and feel about it. <laughs> Does the congruency help you to juggle all those balls like you have all those different companies i looked on your facebook page and i saw all these different links and i'm like how does this guy do that because i I don't have different companies but i have like six or seven um companies that i work with and then i have a couple of my own brands that i would love to develop but i just don't have the (laughs) energy and time for it after working with my clients so yeah what do you feel is the key to doing all of the different things that you do? Is it congruency or, or congruency? I, I, I think it's, else? I think it starts with congruency and intentionality, mm-hmm. right? It's kind of like, you know, like luck happens at the, dis, at the intersection of discipline and intentionality, right? It was like, you got lucky. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Cause I've been doing the same thing every day with one goal in mind. And you know, mm-hmm. luck is the, my overnight success 10 years later. Right. And so when I think about like all those companies, you know, a lot of the times I think people undervalue themselves and they try to convince people that they need to do more than they actually do. They devalue their skill set. They devalue their genius. And the truth is, is that when we really look at the levers in business and the levers in digital marketing and, and all marketing in general, none of it requires eight hours of doing this, right? But we'll convince ourselves that it takes that long. We'll overcomplicate it because we want to justify and validate our worth. And so like when I come to the table as partners or founders in these companies, 
we just establish very clear roles and responsibilities and, and make it a winnable game. And because everything's always on the table, like, you know, I might get a text like, hey, it bothers me when you did that. I'm like, oh, yeah, that would bother me, too. Sorry, let's not do that again. And, you know, we kind of move forward. But there's none of this like codependency, you know, unspoken expectations, gray area, like everything's put on the table. And we those all are real energy suckers, aren't they? Oh yeah. my God. It, it'll, it'll kill you. Like right. the, the incongruency alone will, will just destroy your nervous system because yeah. it's like, you're constantly in fight or flight. You never know. You have the the fears of like, am I doing enough? Are they out to get me? Like, oh, and it's all crap, right? Like at the end of the day, it's all crap. Mm. And the, the truth is, is like, when you know your skill set and you know what your power is, then you just put it on the table. Like, this is what I offer. This is how I do it. This is the best way we can do it. And even with clients, like when I have you know, retainer clients, because I still work with clients like you do. Like I have a couple, I have an MBA team. That's a client of mine. I do all their marketing strategy and they're like, we're going to call you every week. I'm like, no, you're not. (laughs) And they're like, what do you mean? We pay you X. I'm like, and that's not part of the deal. I said, it's one a month. And they're like, "Uh." I'm like, no, I was like, because any more is enablement. And my job is to teach you how to fish, not to hand you a fish. (laughs) And I guarantee you that in that one call we will accomplish more than we could in four smaller calls. Yeah. But I also have to have kind of the intestinal fortitude to stand that and realize that, you know, in business and marketing and in everything, we are constantly training all of those around us on how to interact with us. Mm. We're the ones that are responsible for them thinking they can call us 24 seven or them only calling us once a week to think it's okay to call us at 2 a.m. or wait till 9 a.m. to send mm. us a 911 email or not. And it's, it's a byproduct of kind of how we've shown up and how we've interacted. And, you know, one of the things I teach people is, you know, you train your customers on how to be your customers, but you also train your employees on how to be your employees. Mm-hmm. And I have people come to me running 15, $20 million companies like my team does nothing when I say it, like they don't listen to me. And they're like, oh, I need a different team. I'm like, or you need to realize that you created that. Mm. And then they look me dead in the eye and they don't like it. And I'm like, but let's ask yourself a deeper question. If they don't listen to you, They didn't get hired not listening to you. That's not why you hired them. Mm. They weren't born that way. You created that context in the company. And so you got to go straight to the jugular, take it on the chin and be like, I realize that you don't listen to me because (laughs) in the past I've poo-pooed your ideas. I've put them down. I haven't created space or it feels like I'm running a dictatorship and I'm sorry. And then all of a sudden, you know, things kind of clear up. So when it comes to managing uh, eight, eight or nine companies. I lose track sometimes. I think it's nine now. Um, nine companies, we have very clear containers and boundaries. And so it's mm-hmm. like, we have expectations like, yep, we'll talk twice a week at this time. Anything outside of that will come in an email, but it'll wait to be covered until we're on that call. Anything outside of that, I can disseminate to my team. And so I look at it and, and quite frankly, um, I have a podcast consulting business. I have my own courses and then six other companies. I run six events a year and I only have a team of two. And wow. I do all of that in about six hours a day. Um, mm-hmm. That's that's all I work. I don't start working until about 10 a.m. every day. And then I take a lunch break to put my son down for his nap. And I have a hard stop at five every day. Wow. And so <laughs> I, I think I think when you really think about it, Rod, it's like, you know, if we look at businesses and even clients of yours or anybody looks at their business, if they were to look backwards, you know, 12 months, 24 months and really, really look back and be like, what were the big needle movers in our business? Right. There's there's a couple things like one to three things that probably accounted for 80 plus percent of the success of that company. But yet what we'll do is when we create space and instead of leaving space, we'll try to fill it with something else. And Mm -hmm. we'll try to fill it with something else. And normally that's what starts to rip companies apart from the inside out. Like what they were doing is working. So then they standardize it. They make a process around it and like, let's add more. But Mm -hmm. in adding more, they're basically taking focus away from this and adding distracting behaviors versus what was actually moving the needle and at the expense of their time. And I'm like, nobody here, like, I don't care. Like my employees, like, my number, my number two, I'm like, if you get everything done in two hours a day, I'm still paying you the same. Yeah. I would prefer you do it in two hours a day, then go spend six hours in nature and fill your tank and be ready to go tomorrow. Sure. You know, we don't try to chase like distractions or trends or, you know, temporary behaviors. We look at it and we measure in, you know, years and decades, right? Like I'm not trying to build a company that I sell in two years. Like 
I want this company to be around a hundred years from now. And I wrote a hundred year vision for my business. And so, yeah. you know, and everyone's like, are you doing this? Or are you doing this? Or like the ad account got shut down today. We're losing 50 grand a day or like this pandemic hit. And I'm currently losing about $75,000 a day actively as we speak right now. And everyone's like, what are you going to do? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I cut my pay. I paid our employees and the line of credit is only at a 0.9% interest rate. So I'll run it up as high as I need to because I guarantee you I can return at least 3% with that money mm -hmm. when the market opens back up. Sure. And so I think it's a mixture of like focus and intention and also like really, really tight containers, like leaving no gray area, not letting any shadows exist. Because if you leave that little bit of gray, it turns into a black hole and, you know, it gets a little dangerous, right? It gets like chatty and then scorekeeping and tallying and and none of that is ever healthy and including when you're in service-based businesses because yeah. you have these unhealthy relationships and most of the time when it happens people try to hire me and they're like i want you to do it for me i'm like nope wrong dude <laughs> wrong dude i'm like if you want me to do it for you you're not going to be able to afford my salary because it starts at seven figures a year for part-time and they're like oh uh, i'm like yeah see it's cheaper to do it yourself <laughs> and so my that's kind of how i see it yeah cool Again, there's lots of stuff we could unpack there, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it just made me think one of the sayings my wife and I have, and we've been married for 35 years is let's not keep score. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so true. You know, uh, even with little things like let's just, let's just do it out of love and respect for each other and not, not go, oh, I did the dishes today or I, I, I vacuumed last or whatever. <laughs> just, just do it. <laughs> I totally, I totally agree. And I, I think, you know, there's a really good read for anybody. Um, the infinite game by Simon Sinek is probably one of the best books about vision uh, okay. and how to play the game. And there's a lot of tangible examples in there, but like one that I, I always remember is Victorinex, the, the, the manufacturer of the Swiss army knife mm. on September 10th of 2001, it accounted for 82% of their revenue mm. on September 12th that accounted for a big fat zero because they were no longer allowed to fly on planes. Uh -huh. And what most companies would do is they would lay off employees, right? They would do blah, 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 blah. But they had been playing the long game. They had enough cash reserves. They gave their engineers a raise, basically went at a loss for about a year, pivoted mm -hmm. the company and came out where now they only account for like 18% of their sales, but they like 35 X the company. Hmm. compared to where it was because now they sell watches and clothing and accessories that would have never been in the arsenal because they were kind of playing the long game and wow. you know when we think about that that's a good story for today <laughs> it, for it, it is through. yeah oh it, i mean <laughs> i mean i'm not numb to any of this like i've had night sweats i've had panic attacks and i'm i'm grounded and, and clear on like what this gets to be um but at the same time like you still feel the weight you still feel the uncertainty you still feel you know, all the things that are going on, I feel the effects of this all over the place. And and I am by no means, you know, set up to be like, oh yeah, I could never work again for the rest of my life. Like I might be a part of an own eight multi-million dollar companies, but I take a $2,500 salary a month. Like it, it's not like I'm sitting over here pulling it out. You know, we invest it back in the business. We do this. And, you know, I lost probably $750,000 of deals in about five days when this all hit. And then all of our companies start taking about a $70,000 a day loss. Yeah. And so I've had to really, really check in with myself and be like, is this the game? Am I playing the right game? Is yeah. this the right mindset? And I'm really glad that I did because there's a light at the end of the tunnel. One of my companies, um, you know, last week basically recovered to what it was before and then broke it. And we had our best ever month in April in the midst of a uh, pandemic with a non-essential item that you wouldn't think because it's a diaper bag would be something that people are doing right now. And it ended up turning into a blessing, but only because we refused to react. We didn't react. We didn't flip out. Like we looked at everything and we're like, okay, we get that this is like right now, whether right now is three months or 12 months or 18 months. It's still right now. It's not, you know, permanent. It's temporal. And we were able to make some decisions, allocate some funds, move things around, reduce our pay, change some inventory numbers, and then make it so we could sustain. And I think we figured out we could basically sustain at the loss for about six months before it started to hurt. But because of that and those adjustments, we only really went maybe six weeks. 
And I feel like because of that, we have a deeper foundation because we used all that time instead of laying off employees, we doubled down and we're like, go connect with our customers, call every one of them, do live videos. We were doing art classes with kids at home. We were doing cooking classes with kids at home. We were interviewing moms and dads about their challenges and helping them. We were sending out gifts to first responders and bags for them to use. And, you know, all of that is going to have a very, very positive effect, you know, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days from now because we refuse to react to the situation. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm full of book recommendations. There's another one called uh, the, <laughs> the wedge by my buddy, Scott Carney, uh, that just came out, uh, last week. Okay. Uh, Scott Carney studied cult therapy and wrote another book before that called what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. But what he talks about is, is training your body, training your brain and training in life to, insert a wedge when there's a stimulus, right? So there's a trigger. And in, in, in this whole case, like human agency was removed very fast. Mm. And I mean, very fast. Yeah. And what happens when human agency is removed is that's a big trigger. And what most people did is they reacted and there's nothing wrong with those reactions, right? But reactions are dangerous. And so what Scott talks about is basically all the ways you can use breath and cold therapy in life to insert what he calls the wedge mm. to where it's trigger, long ass gap, and then response versus right. trigger react, trigger react. And I had plenty of moments in that gap of like freak out and panic and, you know, money and denied PPP and how are we going to make payroll? But I never allowed myself in the container of making a decision until I was ready to respond versus react. And, yeah. and it's really, really interesting. And it's a good, you know, principle to have in, in business in general, marketing in general and across the board. And so, you know, when I look at this and I, I, I'm, I've been on phone calls, probably 500 phone calls ranging in, you know, CEOs of companies from pre-revenue all the way up to $37 billion a year. Call me as much as like, and I mean like ring, 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 ring. And I've had a few buddies record the calls and analyze the calls and figure out numbers. And all the ones that were using words like panic and uncertainty and pandemic, they're hurting. And all the ones that are like, it's temporal, we're diving deep, or they're all having like positive results and, and weathering the storm. Uh, and not even weathering, they're they're kind of like surfing the waves of the storm and having fun in the middle of it because they're like, we've been preparing for this. We've been set up for this. We aren't going to react to what's here. We're going to stay clear on our vision of where we want to go and treat this like it's a hundred year business, not a, you know, a one month business or a one quarter business or a pandemic business. And I, I've definitely started to notice now as all the cards have kind of been thrown on the table, you know, who's still... I'd say who's still like, who's th thriving, who's surviving and who kind of just threw in the towel and are like, I'm out. I can't do it. I, I can't, like, I can't. And you know, that's, that's just, I don't know. It's just, it's sad. It, it, I wish I could talk to every single person and, you know, <laughs> do anything I can, but uh, it, it's been, it's been really interesting for sure. It's been eye opening, very, very growth oriented from like a mindset perspective and awareness also very, um, advantageous for me. Uh, I can tell you that my business is probably going to be three times as profitable next year because I was forced to take such a hard look at them mm. in the last 90 days. Expenses, expenditure, you know, marketing dollars, every single thing had the biggest fine tooth comb on it that quite frankly, six months ago, I was like, oh, whatever, put on the card, put on the card. Oh, we'll test it. I don't care if it loses money. And it, it's kind of changed the way that I, I think about it in a good way as well. And so I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned and, and takeaways to be implemented immediately uh, because, you know, this isn't going back. Like anybody who thinks that we're going back to what it was like is, is very, very far off the mark. Okay. Business and marketing will be forever changed due to this event. Commercial real estate will be decimated because <laughs> the amount of people that thought they could never work remotely. Yeah, and, I think so too. Yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of things that if if we pay attention to kind of what's underneath it and find you know, the lessons and the principles, it'll have a very dramatic positive effect on the ones that can kind of navigate through those waters. And so end of, end of diatribe over. <laughs> but I love that principle. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time practicing meditation and learning about it. And, um, it's, it's something I, I don't necessarily apply all the time or a lot of the time, or even yesterday, <laughs> but is, is taking that taking a pause you know you you talked about the wedge but pause a little bit and and get out of that fear flight uh or fight mode 
and take yeah. some time to pause. And see, it's amazing what comes out of that if you just take a just even out of the pause or a silence or stillness, you know, I saw, I saw a good uh, video on TikTok this morning of a psychologist talking about Chinese finger traps. Right. And it's really, really funny because when you're met with resistance, if you try to pull away from it, it tightens and you can't get out. But if you lean into it, you can get your finger out. And it's the same with everything happening here, which is the practice of the wedge. Like everyone's like, what's the purpose? Like, what's the, it's the point. I was like, the end game of life is not action. It's just awareness. So then you choose your action, right? And, you know, being able to navigate these times and, and listen, I have a, I have a very painted history of, you know, death and PTSD and a lot of things I've had to do probably 30 years of work on. And I've invested over seven figures in personal therapy just to be able to like be in this spot from EMDR to cognitive behavioral therapy, to MDMA assisted psychotherapy, to psilocybin, to ayahuasca, to jungles, to solo quest, to five days in silence. Like I've been all of it, stem cells, all of it. And really, really what was so interesting to me is that all those years, like I kept trying to chase something, like I was going somewhere, like there was some sort of finish line or there was some sort of resolution. And then I realized that you know, when you start to understand these things, then you do things like cold therapy or breath work, you can change the entire chemistry of your body in literally a breath or in a second or in a, in a, you know, in a heartbeat. And I, one of my teachers is very, very wise. And we were out at a retreat and he looked over at Mount Shasta and he's like, do you think that mountain gives a crap that somebody's hiking on it or that it's raining out or that there's traffic? And I was like, no, he's like, no, it's just a mountain. That's all it cares about. It's just ex entire existence is being a mountain. And, you know, what you talked about there is it's really, really easy when these things come up, you know, especially business marketing or ad account gets shut down, a product gets pulled down, Amazon pulls it, there's a spam replay, you know, blank happened and blank happened and blank happened. The, the first thing that we tend to do is we try to avoid it or distract away from it or go around it or pivot it when really the, the only path is through it, right? That's where the lessons are. That's where the growth is. That's where the, the next levels are and, and none of it. And I mean, unless somebody's life is on the line, there is zero reason to react to it or do anything about it within the first like six to 12 hours. And, you know, I've watched so many people, so many businesses and entrepreneurs make dire and grave mistakes because they made permanent decisions based on temporary feelings. That writing created. that letter that they should have made should have taken 24 hours and slept on it right <laughs> and so we have like in my company like in all of them we have a 24-hour holding period and like my team knows like something comes across my desk or something bad happens we literally write it on a sticky note stick it on the wall and we won't talk about it for 24 hours we're like we might lose a couple grand we might whatever and i was like but we're not really i was like we're gaining perspective we're getting out of the reaction and looking at it for what it is, not what it feels like, like what it makes us feel. Right. And, um, it's just a really powerful concept that, you know, the more that you can practice being in that discomfort, like, you know, everyone's like, Oh, I, I don't do that social media platform because I don't know how, or I don't want to learn it. I'm like, well, great. I was like, you also didn't know how to walk, but you didn't stop when you fell the first time. Right. Like you just got to learn it. You just got to put in the licks and be like, it's okay that I suck. It's okay that I know nothing about it because in a week from now, you're going to know more. And two weeks from now, you're going to know more. And like nobody's business was born in the after state. Like nobody was born a $3 billion company. Nobody was born a $100,000 company. Like none of them. You know, all those overnight successes. I was like, oh, you mean with their 21 failed ventures before they got there? Yeah, they don't talk about it because it's not the cool story. But it wasn't there. And it's really the ability to stand with structure. Like to be in those moments of like, the world's against me. This isn't going to work. There's no option. But allowing to stand in it so that once you've processed it and it's come out, you start to find the clarity on the other side. Because really the truth is, is if we knew how to get there, we'd all be there. And there is no path for us. Like there is no, you know, Rod's waypoints are different than my waypoints because it's my road that I have to pave. We might have the same destination in mind, but we're going to get there two very drastically different ways. And so I look at my students and I'm like, you know you're winning when you're uncomfortable. When there's not a clear path for you, I guarantee your success because that means you're carving it. It's your growth. It's your path. It's your vision. And like you might grab, you know, like, oh, I'm going to put these tires on my car and I'm going to drive it this way and I might not go over that fast and I'm out of these emergency supplies that you've learned from somebody else. But at the end of the day, you kind of got to carve your own path. And that comes with being uncomfortable and, and being uncertain. And, you know, that's, that's what it happens. And 
you know, I love everyone's like, oh, I want to be Elon Musk. I'm like, great. Well, you got to be him. Like that means you got to be willing to risk risk billions of dollars every single day and, and literally work 120 hours a week. <laughs> work 120 hours a week and yeah. and you know get there and you know I don't I don't have, I don't want that like I <laughs> I'm not gonna sit here and lie to myself and everyone's like oh you want to be I'm like nope I don't need a jet that bad I'm I'm good <laughs> my my family I'll spend time with them yeah. I'll, I'll go ride my bike in the mountains like yeah you know that's what's it that's what's important to me so yeah I mean there. <laughs> We could unpack 8 million things from yeah. what I just said. I, I want to ask you one question that I want to start to ask my guests and we'll yeah. wrap up with this. Please. And um, it you, you've been through a lot of things. You've had a lot of experiences. I feel like we're always trying to figure out who we are. And you've probably had a lot of life-defining moments. But I'm wondering if there's one that really stands out to you. Do you have a real? Yeah. 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 Um, my wife was eight months pregnant with my first child and we were three weeks away from bankruptcy because of how incongruent I ran business and how much I lied to the world and pretended to be somebody I wasn't with millions of followers every day. And it was in the moment that that happened and my son was born and I was so close to losing it all that I walked away from a seven figure business, deleted social media overnight with a million followers and disappeared off the face of the internet for two and a half years to work on what mattered. And, um, that was probably, no, I will say that I've experienced a lot of other things, the death of my father, my own almost death and, and nothing compared to the realization that I'm going to have my child and there's a chance that I will not be able to provide for him because of my inability to have hard conversations with myself and do the real work. And, um, yeah, probably one of the hardest and most defining moments in my life. And for anybody who says social media is not addicting, uh, it took me eight months to get comfortable to not have it. Like I had to replace apps on my phone. So I would open audible instead of Instagram. I had to get used to like the fact that I was still trying to use my phone six to seven hours a day, that I was still seeking validation and dopamine on things I didn't have. Like I get addicted to reading the news and, and it took a long time. And now I live in a life where I spend like 10 minutes a day on social. And my team knows I hate it. So they do all of it. And I just get on there to say hi to people and I love them and I choose it. But uh, it was, it was a very, very defining moment for me because I realized how much of life I was missing by pretending I was building a life rather than just living the life that I wanted to live and then allowing my business to support that. Wow. I'm so glad I asked that question. <laughs> so was it, when you say you did the work and focused on things that were really important, can you describe that just a little bit more? I hear you saying yeah. sort of giving up on an addiction to social media and, um, yeah, I, uh, really, I can sum it up. I've, I've been an addict most of my life. I was addicted to, you know, bulimia stemming from sexual abuse, addicted to narcotics after I almost lost my legs, addicted to extreme sports, adrenaline, a thousand skydive, scuba dive. I mean, you name it. I've done all of it. Uh, all because I was chasing feelings because I avoided actually being in a relationship with the one person I get to spend the rest of my life with, whether I like it or not, which was myself. And so I realized looking back at 33 years of my life, per se, when I had this realization, that in my entire life, I could never remember one moment where I was okay being alone, like without something, without a distraction, a TV show, a phone, a friend, a conversation. And, and, I used words to survive. I used words to manipulate things to survive as a child. I used words to get attention. I used words to feel comfortable because if I could talk about it, it would somehow invalidate the fear. And I was petrified. And I mean petrified of solitude and silence. I didn't sleep for years. I was just, everything was trying to avoid something. And I just, I'll never forget one person, a, a spiritual teacher looked at me one day and, and I would do the same thing. I'm like, I'm just like, I'm just a bad human. Like there's something wrong with me. Like what I've been through, I'll never feel again. Like nobody should witness that and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, well, how would you describe it? I'm like numb. And he's like, numb is a feeling. And it was like this, like light bulb went off. And, uh, you know, it started down this path of like, just kind of looking at things a little bit differently and realizing that like, there is nothing for me out there on this interview in my business even in my family like i mean nothing like if you study quantum physics that might not even exist and they might just be the matrix right like we'll, we'll leave that for another day um 
And it was the first time that I really, really understood what it potentially would look like to be healthy and to kind of be here and all here. And I probably spend now, you know, I normally get up somewhere between four and 5 a.m. And I spend at least the first two to three hours of my day in solitude and silence um, and just sitting and sitting with some thoughts that, you know, three years ago, I never would have thought I would have survived sitting with and and being okay, exploring them and going deep into them. And then I don't allow one external trigger from the world into my life until 10 a.m. No phone, no email, no text, no nothing. It is me and my family from four to 10. And then I make sure that my tank is full, that like my family's tank is full, that I've succeeded in my day already by spending an hour with my son and an hour with my wife and an hour journaling before I even start working. And at that point, it's like a hobby because everything else is already won for the day. Like I'm like, I'm, I'm done. Like I don't have to do anything for today. And so uh, for me, it's, it's really about exploring that deep relationship with myself and, and, and don't think <laughs> it's roses and rainbows. Like I cried for a good two hours this morning. Um, I had to call one of my mentors, friends and business partners and talk through some stuff that was coming up, new stuff, you know, as I processed through one thing, another layer of the onion appeared and, and he's like, you did the right thing. Be with it. Like, just be with it. Like explore it, ask yourself the questions. And so, uh, really, you know, if I had to give any piece of advice, you know, the fastest path to success is being in the deepest, most connected, committed relationship with yourself. I love it. I love it. Because <laughs> relationships will always beat algorithms. Yeah. <laughs> so I can just tie it full circle there. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks for sharing that. That's it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I love it. <laughs> so uh let's see. Is mindofgeorge.com the best place oh, to yeah. for people to connect with you? Yeah. If you want business advice, marketing, tips, tricks a family that cares about you. I basically give away 90% of it for free because I live what I teach. Mm -hmm. um, and we just launched a podcast uh, maybe like a month and a half ago and the feedback is amazing. Uh, lots of people loving it. Uh, everything is between six and 15 minutes for 90% mm -hmm. of the episodes. So each one has one focus. You can listen to it, put into action right away. And then we do one long episode a week to explore like deeper topics. But all of it's at Mind of George. You can get the podcast free trainings that I do, our Facebook group for free. Everything is at mindofgeorge.com. And, uh, you know, my team and I, our only commitment is to empower entrepreneurs or business owners to ethically scale their company. And we'll do anything in our power to do it. And it uh, doesn't even mean you need a credit card. We'll just help you anyways. So <laughs> nice. Well, real pleasure to meet you. And I hope we can talk again. And yeah, I'd love it's to. really cool that we know some of the same people, you know, people in the Vancouver area. So that's I know I know a lot of amazing. them. I, I know of a lot of them. Yeah, it was an absolute honor. And and thank you for having me. And for anybody who watches this, thank you for giving me the one gift I can never give back to you, which is time. You chose it to spend it with me. And so I hope it was helpful and let us know how we can help you. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.